is the Big O Show. This is the Big O Show. It's a W, and that was sweet. On Saturday, as the Canes defeated number 18, NC State, 31 to 30. Tyler Van Dyke, 325 yards, four touchdowns, and no interceptions, which is a beautiful thing. Manny Navarro, of course, covers the Canes on a daily basis and, of course, brings it for the athletic. Follow him on Twitter at Manny underscore Navarro for those of you that are listening on the podcast. Manning. Uh, Manny, good afternoon, my brother, and uh, I guess it was fun to cover good news instead, huh? It's always more fun when they win, Big O. It always is. Uh, you know, they were happy. It was a happy locker room after the game, and uh, you know, these guys. The one thing you got to say for Manny is. There's nobody quitting on him, right? I mean, yes, nope. maybe some of the seniors and, and and the guys that were starting are pissed off at him. But for the most part, I'd say 99, 98% of that locker room is fighting for him and they and they want to win. And, you know, uh, they, they they came to Miami believing in Manny Diaz, and I think they still believe in Manny Diaz, the, the, the kids who were part of this program, the 45 freshmen. And Tyler Van Dyke, you know, he, he backed up his, uh, his well, talk. He, you got to give him credit for the way he played. Yeah, no, I'm serious. I, I listen. I didn't like him talking because mm -hmm. obviously it's a bad team, and you're not in a position to talk. You know, I, hell, I don't even want you guys to be bringing out the stupid chain or anything like that. I don't think, as crappy as you are right now, the turnover chain is embarrassing. You know what I mean? So for me, there's some things that I'm already kind of against as it is. Uh, and talking was one that I was like, I was cringing as he was talking because he was acting like they were, you know, nine and oh and stuff and right. they were wheeling and dealing it. But hey, man, if you're going to talk it and you then walk it, then hey, kudos to you, man. I'm going to give you props. And that's when I got home after the concert because I went to see the fix that night and I got home to see the uh, the game. I was so impressed. Uh, the moxie the kid has out there on the field. I, you got to like what you see from Tyler Van Dyke. And, and uh, Garcia cannot be happy with that, by the way. <laughs> no, no, I'm sure. I'm sure that, uh, you know, listen, it, it's an ever-evolving fluid situation, right, with these kids and these quarterbacks. And they all come to college to play. They don't come to sit the bench. And so that'll be another storyline down the road. But as far as for right now, I mean, I thought Tyler Van Dyke, there were some plays, the first touchdown pass in particular, where he was going to get hit and he knew he had a one-on-one -on -one with, with Rambo and he trusted right. his receiver and he put the ball up. I mean, he, he just placed it perfectly where yeah. his guy could get underneath the ball and make the catch. And he trusted him and he did it. And then, and then the last touchdown I thought was really impressive as well. Another RPO type situation where you have a split second to make a decision. And not only did he, did he, you know, hit Rambo for the touchdown, but where he placed the ball, only Rambo could have grabbed that ball. There was no tips, no interceptions. So, to me, the guy showed improvement, right? I mean, he he kind of has a sidearm motion anyway. He kind of throws the ball a little. Uh, it's not always over the top type delivery, and uh, you know he's throwing it between hands and he's putting the ball where it needs to go. So, very encouraging performance. And the reality is, uh, Miami's only going to win more games this season because of Tyler Van Dyke. They need him to play at his best. If he's not anywhere near that, they're, they're probably not going to win too many games. Granted, uh, after Pittsburgh this weekend, you're playing against teams with uh, losing records, right? Georgia Tech, Virginia Tech, Florida State, Duke all have losing records right now. I think they're all three and four. But, but no, there's no gimmies for them. There's, just, there's I mean, no gimmies. But he needs, it, he needs it's, to play it's a nice win this week, but that doesn't mean that all of a sudden right. he becomes some kind of a good team or anything like that. But still, right. uh, it was, you know, watching him, watching the rooster, that kid, man, that kid you is special, dude. Showed, showed flashes of Duke Johnson to me, you know, just, just right. the explosive nature. And then yeah. – really finding small i mean I, I was watching the game on binoculars up there from the press box and i'm like this dude has like zero space to work with and he's still getting three four five yards and it's just tough running and he's and he's a light guy and he's and he's getting pounded pretty good he's taking some shots and and so he's a tough kid uh you know uh, he, to me what i'd like to see happen here over the over the last half of the season is Let's see a little more Cody Brown just to save this kid's body because you you need Jalen Knighton in, in the open space to, to make the kind of plays that he makes. By the way, I looked this up uh, after the game. 
Um, he's got two games now where he's got over 70 yards receiving and over 70 yards rushing. Uh, this Jalen Knighton kid. That's only happened nine other times at Miami <laughs> since 2000, and he's done it twice already. So uh, kudos to that kid. He's 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 a real dynamic two way threat. Yeah, no, he had 83 yards in both receiving and uh, and rushing, and it's he's a fluid runner, man. It just mm -hmm. you know, it, not that he has the same running style, but it it just it has it has that um, that Eric Dickerson feel to it that. There's a gear there always that can just take off, and it looks so effortless in the way he runs. You know what I mean? He kind of reminds me of Eric in that sense. Completely different running backs, but I'm just saying it's just one of those things. You can just see the talent. Well, you see you know, him create. You see him create. Like separation. when you watch Cam Harris, you watch a a lunch pail running back. Right. When you watch this kid, you watch a special talent at running back. You know, it's like there's. There's a difference, dude. There's just – it's like another level, you know? It is. Just, it's impressive. Man. And I would say, you know, if you look to the future and you say, man, what what it would be like to have him and Don Chaney Jr. together, I mean, that that's a hellacious one-two punch, you know, when you when you start looking ahead the next season. And I like the other two kids behind him, uh, both Thad Franklin and – and. Uh, Cody Brown. I mean, they've got they've got some talented running backs. It's just a shame that they, they they lost two of them already halfway through the season. So yeah, that's rough. Um, I thought Charleston Rambo. I mean, he came to play too, man. Nine catches. Yeah, and another great game and a couple touchdowns. Yeah, and and you look back at his Michigan State game. He's now had two games with that that you call uh, in the fantasy world, right? Boom or bust. He's had he's had two of those boom games where he's really put up huge numbers and been reliable. Listen, the kid wants it, man. He wants to play in the NFL. He's heard some of the things you know people have said about him. I reported that you know as good as he's played so far, NFL scouts are still kind of weary that hey, he gets pushed out of bounds a little too easily. He's a little bit too much of a lightweight. And, you know, the kid's trying to uh, put put stuff on film to show people that he's tough and that he's reliable. And, you know, uh, he was a kid who also dealt with drops in the past. Oh, I haven't seen him really drop too many balls, if any, this year. I mean, he's, he's yeah, been pretty right, consistent. Actually. Yeah, yeah. At Oklahoma, he dropped a few balls uh, deep down the field. He's not having any of those issues. So he's played well. Um, you know, I think Keyshawn Smith continues to have his part. The most encouraging part out of this last game, besides uh, Ramble, was that Will Mallory came to life. Right, I was going to tell you there was Will Mallory sighting. Yeah, I was going to tell you. Yeah, that. yeah. I, I, I think uh, you know after the game, I heard uh, Tyler Van Dyke say that he had had a conversation with Will and and tried to tell him, hey, you know what, screw screw all the outside noise, just put that behind you, come out and play. And he trusted him, man. That third and sixteen, he could have thrown it underneath to Jalen Knight, and and instead he trusted the guy to make the catch over the middle, and he did. So big play. That was big. Yep. That was that was uh, absolutely beautiful. Um, what'd you think of, uh, Manny's passionate plea? Uh, listen, man, all you can do is, is, is coach, right. And, 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 and put out a plea that, Hey, I'm trying to get this thing right. Oh, I, I told you, I mean, our, our conversation this summer, he was very passionate about how, you know, this isn't just about him that in general, whoever was coach of this team would have to deal with some of the issues he's having to deal with. Right. That you need, yeah. you, you any guy in his shoes, it's not like you could just throw anybody in his shoes and voila, magic. Miami all of a sudden is is 2001 good again, you know. And I think he he really feels and I've told you this, he cares about this job. He loves this job. This was his dream job. He doesn't want to lose this job and he's going to put his heart and soul into it. And, you know, I, I, I thought yesterday what he said about I'm not just coaching, you know, to win one game for my job, etc. Um I, I I thought he was speaking from the heart. You know, I think he was speaking from a, from a place that, that is very real. It's stuff that he said to me in the past. And uh, I, I think, uh, you know, one of the interesting takeaways from yesterday for me was how he basically said, look, uh, <laughs> we, we've tried to recruit, right? And we're not having a great season. And um, maybe now we need to sort of look to the transfer portal and look wherever we have to go to find players to help fill this team. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of pressure, obviously, down here in South Florida to land the elite kids. But he was banking on having a good season to get really good players from South Florida to, to, to commit here before signing day. And I don't know that he necessarily waved the white flag yesterday and said we're giving up. But he certainly said enough to make you feel like uh, he's not going to sit on his hands and be like, well, our recruiting class sucks and, and we're just going to take guys to take guys. I think he, he, he knows that uh, 
you know, he's got to pivot to the transfer portal and find guys like he has. And, and, and you know what, if he keeps his job and he comes back next year, which, you know, I know you believe he will um, going to the transfer portal and, and finding guys to fill needs. Isn't the worst thing he's, he's had plenty of success with it in the past. And uh, I, I think, uh, you know, we'll see what they end up getting uh, come December, but, I, I, I think they can still get some really good players through the transfer portal. Every year he he gets at least one or two quality starters out of the transfer portal. Um, well, it all with, depends on how he finishes, right? I mean, that's – Right. I, because if he finishes terrible, I think he's going to lose some of the guys he currently has on his team and any of the commits. Right. But if he finishes strong and somehow then sh- kind of shines a light and says, okay, look, a bunch of our young guys have turned it around – you can join our young guys in the process of turning this around. Then I think it does become a sell job for him there. I agree. And, and I, and, and at this point, you know, I, I, I said before the NC state game, I thought they would finish six and six. Right. I think that's, that's a fair guess with the schedule they have remaining. Now that they've got that win, I think they've got a chance at seven wins. And I don't know that that necessarily fires any recruits up, but it's certainly better than a four or five win season. Right. Where, where, Amen. Amen. And 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 so I think you can still salvage this, especially if the young guys continue to grow the way they did. And I thought there was a tremendous amount of growth on both sides of the football from some young guys. And you know what? We're going to see a lot of James Williams. We're going to see a lot of Cam Kitchens. We're going to see a lot of Leonard Taylor and and a lot of the young guys who have been clamoring to get in there. Marcus Clark is, is another example. He's a guy that was part of the 2020 recruiting cycle. He gets his first start, and I thought he looked really good out there at cornerback. Oh, so they have another guy here where you're like, okay, here's another piece. Here's somebody else that you look at and you say, okay, they're bringing these young guys along, and maybe there's hope for the future here. You know, uh, something you said uh, before I let you go that um, you know you you were mentioning that hey, you you think he's coming back next year in Manny, and I do, I do think he's coming back. But last last week, you you mentioned something that threw me a little off. And that's you hear that maybe Blake James is the guy they may not end up surviving. Right now, if they finish strong, Blake survives. If they don't, Blake's the guy that that goes down. You think not Manny? Is that is that what you're you're kind of read? Is that the tea leaves you're reading right now? Well, I think more than anything, what I'm reading is that there's a lot of dissatisfaction, um, and I, I I would think that both of them aren't necessarily safe is what I would say. And, okay. and, and I think that in the event that this thing goes very wrong, I could see both of them being gone. Now who goes first, eat all that salary. What's, what's Blake got left on his deal. Do you know? I don't, I don't. I was looking at some, uh, at some tax returns information last night, uh, looking at different salaries and stuff from 2019. And it, look, I, I think overall, you know, Miami fans obviously know you, it, to fire Manny Diaz, pay him to go away, um, you know, and his assistant coaches, right? Because it's not just yes. Manny, it's other guys too. Um, that's going to be very costly. So, I, again, to me, it would have to be a disastrous finish. This would have to be the team quitting on him. This would have to be, you know, getting blown out at Pittsburgh and, and then losing to Georgia Tech and Florida State. Like those kind of things, I think, would have to happen for, for there to be you know, changes across the board. And I, and I don't know that that's going to happen, right? Like right now with what Tyler Van Dyke showed me on Saturday, I really do think they're going to be both eligible because if that kid is playing at that level, they're going right, to beat some, exactly. some right. of the other, I mean, NC state wasn't a bad team, dude. Oh and man. They're good defense. They had a very good defense. Number one, third down defense. And this kid was making really smart decisions. So if you have a quarterback and the defense is getting better, like it looked on Saturday, where all of a sudden you're not having, you know, 30 missed tackles or 25 missed tackles. Uh, I think that gives them a chance. Granted, look, they still could have lost that game, right? If that fumble on the punt return uh, holds and that kid for NC State doesn't lose his helmet, they probably lose the game. But to me, they're right there and probably good enough to win, you know, those last four games. All right. So, dude, you, 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 you like threw chum in the water. Okay, you can't do this to me. You, you, you <laughs> what did I do? What did I do? What did I do? I'm looking at tax records here. What the hell does Blake James make? Um, 
I don't I have know. I, I don't have the pa- want to know. I, I don't have the paperwork in front of me right now. Uh, maybe I can save that for Friday. That'll be a nice tease for Friday. I'll come back with some of these answers. But um, I know. I, I think. Know I think you're paying that guy, bro, to do absolutely nothing. I'm just wondering. Well, I know he isn't among the higher uh, paid uh, people at Miami. There's plenty of others ahead of him. Um, okay. But, but um, I can say this. I mean, I, Miami as a school, for I think according to the tax records that I saw last night, I had a friend of mine who's a tax specialist look at it for me because it was 250 something pages. Um, I, I think their pro- total profit for 2019 was somewhere around 89 million. Now that's the entire school. OK, the entire school, not just the athletic program, the entire oh, school. Okay. You compare that to Clemson or Alabama or oh, Auburn, who, who as an athletic program made, you know, 50 million or 100 or 75 million just as an athletic program made that much money. It puts into perspective, right, what it is that Miami's going to spend on its next coach if it hires its next coach or what it's going to hire ever. You know, I mean, right. for them to the highest paid coach in Miami history that's is Mark Rick. The medical, the medical money is not included in there. That's the thing. Um, Everything they're producing in Jackson and all those other right. places, you're not, you're not getting any, you're not getting those figures because they're private entities. So right. that that's probably, you know, that's probably fudging the books in another way because that's not money directly in the school. That's part of a business that's tied to the school. Correct. Right. But, yes, but I mean, still, as a university, this is the endowment, right? Making 90 million off of or 89 million off of, uh, I think they spent, they made somewhere around 4.3 or 4.4 billion or, or made that total and then spent 4.31, whatever it is, whatever is the difference to make $89 million. So, I mean, overall, their, their, their budget, not nothing like a lot of other, <laughs> other schools. Um, and, and, uh, in the long run, man, like you just look at the history. How much have they spent on coaching? Four million dollars is the most they've ever spent on a coach. And that was Mark yes. Rick a couple of years ago. So look at right. look at you look at that USA Today uh, list and see how many coaches are making over four million a year. Pat Narduzzi's making more than more than four million a year. That's the coach okay. you're playing against Saturday. Right. And that and you gotta buy somebody better than that. Right. That's the point. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what are they going to spend six million on a coach all of a sudden eight million on a coach right i mean that's what i think it would it would probably take and then pay other guys to go away right. i don't you know that's not miami's nature right yeah that, that's why that's why i think for sure manny returns because he's got two years left dude if he had a year left i can see them saying okay you're out of here but two years left wow that's a lot and yep. so what, what do you by the way, what's what's the ballpark figure you think Blake makes? Probably a million dollars or a little less than that. I mean, okay. you know, that's typical for athletic directors. They don't get paid ridiculous amounts of money. Granted, they work around the clock and but uh yeah. I I don't have it right in front of me. I was looking at it last night with one of my one of my tax buddies, and uh, I was trying to make sure the documentation was legit. And uh, so he looked up the real stuff online. And was giving me some figures, you know, and, and we were kind of comparing it. I said, let's look at Alabama. Let's look at LSU. Let's look at Clemson and see what their overall numbers are. And, you know, because that is a big debate, right? We all want to know how much money is really available, right? Miami's a yeah. private school. Uh, they don't release any records of, you know, so we kind of have to go off of tax returns. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, I'm with you there. By the way, that around the clock shit doesn't fly with me. You know why? Because your ass works around the clock. My ass works around the <laughs> clock. Because while we do, like, your writing or I do my show, we still right. got to go watch games and read articles right. all day long, all night long. You know, I love it when people go, ah, your job's easy, bro. You just talk three hours a day. You know, they think, like, I just turn on the mic and I can just talk three hours. And like, <laughs> I didn't need to fill my head up with some information in order to get to three hours. You know what I'm saying? So exactly. I always laugh with that. So we but- all work around the clock dude pretty much I, i've had so many friends go man i'd love to have your job just to sit and watch games i go you really think that's all i do bro? Like, really? is, right? how about how about the 47 phone calls that i make a day to different people right like what about that <laughs> so, uh, i i know i get it we we have a fun job that we right. love 
Mm -hmm. But it is a job. Don't kid yourself, okay? There's a lot of effing work that goes through it. I even tell people, like, I, what's not your thing and my thing, TV. You watch somebody do a two-minute sports package. You don't realize that that dude or woman had to go down to camp, hang out for a couple of hours, wait for a couple of hours for a player just to get a two-minute soundbite, then fo follow the coach, and then the editor had to edit it. The cameraman had to film everything. You have to go get, like, maybe another interview somewhere else. You don't realize – people don't realize that, that that person on TV spent six hours to do that two-minute package. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like it's the shit that people don't realize that what, what goes through, through all of us. Yeah, it's a fun job, but there's a lot of bullshit that goes with bro there's yeah. a lot of it you know what i mean yeah no it, and and you gotta put up with a lot in order to do what we do in other words and and now social media really has made it so much more difficult because like yeah you think about the nicosi perry era at miami right like how many times was that guy posting a video and i'm sitting there having to look every single night like what is this guy putting online you know what kind of inappropriate stuff am, are we going to hear about in the morning or, or whatever you know and and that's and that's part of the deal now. We have to be on top of everything that they do. I know. You got to follow everybody. It's uh, it's crazy stuff. And you do mm -hmm. an awesome job, my brother. And I know we're very appreciative of what you do every week here on the uh, on the show. So, Manny, thank you, my brother. Appreciate you. Make sure you uh, subscribe to The Athletic. Incredibly affordable. You'll get all the local stuff and national and international with the little soccer, too, on top of all of that. Follow him on Twitter at Manny underscore Navarro. Manny, we will catch up again on Friday, my friend. You'd be good. Thanks, brother. Good talking to you. You got it. There you go. The great Manny Navarro and our Canes wear Miami Hurricanes report.